shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Here's today's prophecy update. Bishop John E. Putnam stood at the podium and exclaimed to the crowd, who here loves Israel and the Jewish people? The thunderous applause indicated the ecstatic approval by more than 500 pastors, ministers, and their families attending a recent conference of United Pentecostal Church International. This avid support of Israel by Pentecostals stands in stark contrast to many old line Christian denominations that are divesting from Israel and boycotting the Jewish nation. The denominations that no longer believe the Bible to be the divinely inspired word of God have lost their biblical reason for supporting Israel. On the other hand, Christian denominations that still believe the Bible to be the Word of God hold fast to scriptures that declare concerning the seed of Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those that curse you. According to the American Political Science Association, Pentecostalism is the world's fastest growing religious movement. A Pew Forum analysis estimates that there are about 279 million Pentecostal Christians internationally. The Bible prophesies that the United States will stand by Israel throughout the end times. I'm sure the growth of Pentecostalism will have something to do with this. Well, big developments in the Middle East today. France is convening a Middle East summit on May the 30th without Israel or the Palestinians attending. This according to today's Jerusalem Post. France will convene a summit on May 30th of some 30 countries and international organizations to discuss the parameters for an international peace conference to be held in the French capital in the second part of the year, French Foreign Minister Jean-Marc Ayrault said Thursday, neither Israel nor the Palestinians will be invited to the summit, though they will be asked later to join the peace conference. Now let's pause just a moment right there. You do realize what I'm saying to you. They are going to be discussing a solution to the Arab-Israeli peace problem. If a conclusion can be reached successfully, the Bible prophesies when a peace is concluded between Israel and the Palestinians, ladies and gentlemen, it will mark the beginning of the final seven years to the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So a little over one month from today, May the 30th, they are convening this summit to plan for a larger international conference later on in this year in the hopes of bringing about a peace solution while President Obama is still in office, while Mahmoud Abbas is still in office. They believe the time has come to get this done right now. Could it happen yet in 2016? Could the final seven years to Armageddon begin yet in 2016? What an awesome thing to think about. Well, let me finish the article for you. There is no other solution to the conflict other than a two-state solution. Israelis and Palestinians living side by side in peace and security with Jerusalem, a shared capital, Aralt said in Paris. Now let's pause just a moment there. 
Why must Jerusalem be a shared capital? Just because the Palestinians say so? I mean, after all, the Jews say no. So there's a huge conflict. This is the big cog in the wheel here of a peace agreement. Now, the Bible tells us that Israel is not going to surrender Jerusalem to be a shared capital with the Palestinians. And Israel said this repeatedly. Israel has said, this is our eternal capital. It is to be undivided forever. They're going to stick by it. Now, they are going to make a peace agreement, which they should not do. They are going to create a Palestinian state in the area of Judea, Samaria, more commonly referred to as the West Bank, which they should not do. They are going to agree to share the Temple Mount establishing worship sites for both Muslim and Jews there, including the building of the Jews' third temple. So they are going to do those things, but they're not going to share the ownership of the city of Jerusalem. All of this will be up for discussion at this international conference. Ladies and gentlemen, we are entering a new phase as we move ever closer to the fulfillment of one of the two greatest prophecies in the last 2,000 years. I'm talking about one of the two greatest prophetic fulfillments since the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is heady territory, to say the least. Continuing on, according to a spokesperson at the French embassy in Tel Aviv, the May 30th meeting will be on the basis of the 2002 Arab League's peace plan. The list of those to be invited to the parley was not released, though it is expected to include representatives from the United States, Russia, European Union, the United Nations, the Arab League, and the members of the UN Security Council. The invitations to the meeting are expected to be sent out Friday, which of course is tomorrow. Palestinian Foreign Minister Riyad al-Malik meanwhile said at the UN that the Palestinians welcome the summit and are looking forward to help. Now, what does he mean by that? Looking forward to help. Well, apparently they are confident that the international community is going to help pressure Israel to do what the Palestinians want Israel to do. So that's where we are right now. Interesting breaking news to say the least. I am taking your calls on the program today. The number to call to be on the air with me, 877-END-TIME, 877-363-8463. We have some other news for you, but I want to get to the phones right now. Steve is calling from Nevada. Hello, Steve. Hi, Irvin. Hey, uh, yeah, these are some interesting times. They are. And a bit, you know, unnerving. You know, yeah, we got to go through it, though. That's all there is to it. Well, I called, I wanted to share about uh, the blood moons. Okay. Uh, in, uh, when Israel became a nation, there was four blood moons. When Jerusalem was recaptured, four blood moons. And then 2014, 2015, we had another four blood moons. Twelve. Of those 12 blood moons, six were the Passover and six were the Feast of Tabernacles. Of course, you know, obviously God has linked those two together for purposes one of them, I believe, is that, uh, so I link them together. From the first day of the, pa of the worship cycle to the 14th day is Passover. You get to Passover. Then the 15th of the seventh month to the 22nd is Feast of Tabernacles. When you link them together, you get 22 consecutive days, the length of the master plan timeline I shared with you. Well, so I asked, is there a place in Scripture where, you know, this... Can, is confirmed to Zechariah 14. In Zechariah 14, now, the 14 there, I 
would dare to believe represents not only the number of Passover, but the 14th day of the Master Plan timeline. In, in, that, in the 16th, chapter, 16th verse, it states this, the people that remain of the nations that came against Jerusalem will be commanded to observe the Feast of Tabernacles year after year in that 14th day. So they're, they're linked. Well, so the, past, the tabernacles, they build a new tabernacle on the, and ready for habitation on the 15th day, and then tabernacle the last eight days with God. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, in the 20th chapter, it claims that we, we, will, be, we will be priests with God and Christ and reign for a thousand years. Then the next one says, when those thousand years are expired, so the 14th day ends in the 20th chapter, and the 15th day begins in the 21st chapter. Well, the first verse of the 21st chapter is, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Okay, Steve, so, see, uh, sort of bring everything into focus. We're going a long time here. So what's the, okay, uh, what's okay. the bottom conclusion? That we have, we're approaching the 14th day where the Passover will be, and then we will tabernacle with God in the new tabernacle, which was pre-announced and exhibited for will be for a thousand years by everyone on earth by commandment, and then we will tabernacle with God from the 15th millennia to the 22nd millennia, the end of the master plan timeline. And look, and what I've shared with you is a summary of that. Okay, so, listen, uh, listen, Steve, I'm going to let you go because I'm trying to follow very carefully what you're saying here, and I'm not sure I can make sense of all of it, but I am going to go ahead and let you go. Let me just say this concerning the blood moons. We just came through a promotion about the blood moons. It was, it was hyped to high heaven, and there were millions of books and DVDs sold. Now, we made a DVD here, and we stated very clearly that the the four blood moons is not contained in the Bible. Uh, there were people that tried to give it biblical significance. They quoted the scriptures such as, uh, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon will be turned to, to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Jesus Christ himself said it would happen after the tribulation, Matthew 24, verse 29. He said, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light. So as to happen after the great tribulation the Great Tribulation has not happened yet. Consequently, that particular prophecy about the moon turning to blood had nothing to do with the four blood moons of 1493 and 94, of uh, 1949, 1950, 1967, and 1968. And I stated in my DVD that there was an in interesting coincidence that there were four blood moons in 1493 and 94, and the Spanish Inquisition, a major event in the life of the Jewish people, happened in 1492, just a year earlier, not on the exact time, a year earlier. And then the four blood moons occurred in 1949, 1950, and the rebirth of the nation of Israel was one year earlier in 1948. Then in 1967 and 68, there were four blood moons, and the city of Jerusalem was reunited at that particular time. So I analyzed all this and said, well, it's an interesting pattern. And so I will not totally discount it. I mean, when you talk about three out of three with major Jewish events happening, I was not willing to totally discount it. At the same time, I made sure I said, this is observing a pattern, but it's not a biblical prophecy. Well, then, 19, in 2014, 2015, many people intimated that some world-changing event would happen during the four blood moons of 2014, 2015. Some people went so far as to indicate that the rapture would happen during this time. Well, it's all past, and guess what? Nothing happened. So the pattern did not hold, and like I said before, uh, 
it's not a biblical prophecy because the prophecy about the moon turning to blood pertains exactly to after the tribulation. It's several places in the book of Revelation and every time it's the same time. So I just want to make sure we have things clear. There's a lot of theories that, that float around out there and I just wanted to make sure that we understand that sometimes people jump to conclusions with no biblical basis and uh, you know that can discredit true understanding of biblical prophecy, which we don't want to do. And none of that is uh, talking about your particular observations here. Steve, I was trying to follow you the best I could, uh, even though I didn't fully understand everything you were saying. Anyway, thank you very much for your phone call. Uh, let's go now to Mississippi. Fred is calling. Fred, are you there? Uh, you're on the air. All right, listen, uh, I won't take a lot of your time. I heard a uh, preacher on the radio the other day saying that you talked about a third of the, of the population being killed, and he said that a third of the population of Israel would be would die in that. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know where he came from that, but he didn't have the two billion you had. He's talking about two hundred thousand in Israel compared to that. You follow me? Yes, I am following you, and I'm also going to the passage right now that does talk about a lot of people being killed in Israel during the uh, time called the Great Tribulation. Uh, I'm going there right now because I wanted to read uh, what he is referring to. This is Zechariah chapter number 13. It says... Uh, in verse number seven, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall scatter. And I will turn mine hand upon the little ones and it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. Now I believe that this is the prophecy he is referring to. Only this prophecy says, that two thirds will be cut off and die and a third will be left. Now, if two thirds of Israel was destroyed presently uh, in Israel today, there are, uh, I'm trying to see, it's uh, about 8 million people. So two thirds of that would be about uh, 2.3 million that would be left alive and all the rest would be killed. However, this prophecy is a little vague. There are some Jews who believe that one third of the Jews were already killed back under Nazi Germany because there were 18 million when World War II began and by the time it was over, there were uh, 12 million Jews left. One third of them were killed. I cannot tell you for certain if this prophecy in Zechariah chapter number 13 and verse number eight, whether it means literally that two-thirds of all the people who live in Israel will be wiped out during the Battle of Armageddon, I simply don't know the answer to that. However, I do think that's the scripture he was referring to. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you listening to Okay, you're welcome, Fred. And by the way, this scripture should not be confused with the prophecy of Revelation chapter number 9, verse 13 through 16, which specifically states that one third of mankind worldwide will be killed in World War III, a war that's going to emanate from the Euphrates River. And by the way, Russia has troops on one side of the Euphrates at this moment. The United States has troops on the other side of the Euphrates at this moment, and ISIS controls the Euphrates in the middle. So interesting scenario. Are we in fact watching the fulfillment of Revelation chapter number nine, verse 13 through 16? Because the Bible specifically says that that war that kills one third of mankind will start from the Euphrates River. Uh, I mean, we're living in such prophetic territory. I mentioned at the early part of the program that when the Middle East peace agreement is signed, that will be one of the two greatest prophetic fulfillments in the last 2000 years. Well, the other prophetic fulfillment will be the Euphrates River War that kills one third of the human race. So both of these things appear to be in motion right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you this for sure. We are in the end time 
at this very time. So uh, it's such an important time that we live and we do not need to be asleep at the wheel. God's people need to be accelerating evangelistic efforts than never before. Oh, one more thing I want to say before I go to our next caller. An earlier caller called and saying, saying, well, the, the things that lie ahead, I'm very concerned. I'm dreading what's coming. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the wrong attitude. The things that lie ahead are engineered by God to create the climate for the greatest revival the world has ever known. I'm talking about the war that kills one third of mankind. I'm talking about a Middle East peace agreement marking the beginning of the final seven years. I'm talking about within three and a half years after the peace agreement, the Jewish temple will be rebuilt and animal sacrifices will be resumed. I mean, these are going to be huge prophetic fulfillments that are going to absolutely scream to the people of the world and it's going to trigger great revival. And there's going to be many more things. So all of the events of the end time, sometimes Christians look at this and say, oh, we're going to be persecuted. But you know, if we're not into self-preservation, if we're in fact into world evangelism, instead of this being a negative, all these things are going to feed right into our hands for the greatest revival. Now listen to me carefully. The greatest revival the world has ever known. Do I have Bible for that? Absolutely. Revelation chapter number seven, verse number nine. John said, after this, I saw a great multitude that no man could number. They were out of every kindred, every tongue, every nation. And the elder that stood by said to me, what are these? I said, I don't know, what are they? He said, these are they that are come out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So the time just ahead of us, which will contain the three and one and a half year great tribulation, the Bible says there will be a great multitude that no man can number that will be saved during these times just ahead. I'm telling you the grace revival. You say, what if I get killed? You go to heaven early. You know, there's so many of us, we forget we're all going to die anyway. So what's it matter whether we die two or three years early or late? The fact is, if we have eternal life, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We need a revival of dedication and fervor in the Christian religion. Everybody's into self-preservation. How many cars do I have in my garage? How much do I have in the bank? How's my retirement account doing? The Bible says, lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where the moth and the rust doth corrupt and the thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I'm telling you, it's time for Christians everywhere to become sold out to Jesus Christ and to the greatest revival just ahead that this world has ever known. I hope that you will believe with us, pray with us and join with us as we work toward this end. Back to the phones now. Lori is calling from New York. Hello, Lori. Lori, you're on the air. Okay, have we lost Lori? Apparently we have. Let's go now to Josh in Indiana. Hello, Josh. Hey, Brother Baxter. I just want to give you an amen after that little spiel. That was great. Thank you very much. And, uh, I'd also like to say, that uh, because of your show, and your ministry, you brought me back from the brink. So I just want to say God bless. Praise God for that. And, uh, okay, so basically, you know, with that being said, I'm, I'm a little bit of a greenhorn yet when it comes to understanding this and that. Uh, so my question to you is, I'll take my answer off the air, is I don't understand the whole Jewish scenario. Like, why don't they believe in Jesus as their Savior, for one? And what do they believe about Jesus, for two? And then three, what does Christianity look like over in Israel? Uh, hopefully you can answer these. I've been wondering it for a while, and thanks again, brother. Okay, thank you very much, Joss. I'll do my best. First of all, Christianity in Israel right now is not in a revival phase. There are somewhere around 20,000 Christians living in Israel. However, they're somewhat disjointed. They do not have good leadership and we are not in a revival phase in Israel at this present time. However, we soon will be. The revival is definitely coming. So I uh, just wanted to let you know that. Now, 
Uh, the other questions that you've given, Josh, let me just take a moment to concentrate to see if I can recall what else you said because you had several qu questions in a row uh, there. All I, oh yes, what do Jews in Israel think of Christianity and why don't they believe in Jesus Christ? Well, the Jewish people have been blinded. The Bible says they would be blinded for 2,000 years. They are now being brought back to the nation of Israel, just like the Bible prophesies in Ezekiel 37 that they would be. And they are entering a new revival phase. The Bible says blindness in part hath happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and yet all Israel shall be saved. There is a shifting right now of God back to the Jewish people. Now, in the beginning of the church age, there were Jews and Gentiles combined in the early church. There are going to be Jews and Gentiles combined in the end time church. That's the reason we have a college in downtown Jerusalem. Uh, that's the reason we are holding annual prophecy conferences there because uh, that way we can help this revival plus uh, end time ministries. The end of the age television program is on twice per day in Israel. And we are teaching the prophecies of the Bible to the nation of Israel right now. So the seeds are presently being sown for the revival that is just ahead. Now, we're up against a break. I see Lori is back. Lori, I'm coming to you first immediately after the break. So just stay right there where you are. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to say to all of you uh, that if you do not have a comprehensive understanding of Bible prophecy, we have a 14 DVD set called Understanding the End Time. I believe every person on earth needs to go through this course now. It will hold you fascinated. It's not hard to get through. Pop in the DVDs to get your own copy of Understand the End Time. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. And while you're calling, why not become a partner with End Time Ministries? If you already have the set, call. Become a partner with End Time Ministries. We need you now. The golden age of the church is just ahead of us. This is actually a depiction of the false prophet. The Bible teaches us there are two rulers in the end time, a political leader and a spiritual leader. The political leader will head the one world government. The spiritual leader will head the one world religious system. Well, this is that man. He's going to look like a Christian. He actually is going to be the world's leading Christian. But yet, he will speak so deceptively that the world will obey him. But the fact is, they will be obeying the master plan of the dragon. That's the reason we need more than a surface knowledge of God's Word in these days in which we live. We better know what we believe. We need to get our Bibles off the shelf and start reading them because it's God's Word that will keep us from going into apostasy and into error. One more thing we need to notice while we're here with this second beast. The Bible says he causes the world to follow the first beast. He is going to endorse the one world government. He's going to tell all the people of the world, this is a good thing. You should follow this man. This man is leading us to peace. But don't you believe it? Because it's really the master plan of the dragon. Call 1-800-END-TIME to order this important lesson. If your radio station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com and click the watch button to continue today's broadcast. You can also finish up later by clicking the archives button. We are going right back to the phones, and Lori is calling from New York. Hello, Lori. Hi, how are you? Can I'm, you hear me? I hear you fine. What's on your mind? Uh, a lot of things uh, regarding the Bible and what you just uh, talked about with the <laughs> with the Temple on the Mount. Uh, that that one was a new one for me to to listen to. But I'm trying to figure out. I mean, geez. I had people tell me the other day and that uh, Mr. Cruz was the last Christian that we have hope for to get into the, 
you know, president seat, and that just kind of really rubbed me the wrong way. And I don't, you know, I don't know this fella, you know, outside of what I learned. But when I have, you know, people that are Christians, you know, from different churches that I'm affiliated with say things like that, and, you know, what you were just speaking about, the end times and this Christian person, you know, man that's going to go in there that speaks eloquently. Nobody speaks better than uh, Mr. Cruz. I mean, everybody's worried about Donald Trump getting in there. Donald Trump does not speak eloquently, and I don't think he could get Christians to follow him. But besides that, I, uh, I'm going on YouTube. I'm listen, uh, listening to the pastors on YouTube with these false flags that are coming out. I don't know if that's biblical, where they're you know going to build these uh, arches of uh, Palmyra in a uh, thousand cities, starting with New York and London. I don't know if that's biblical. I'm reading last night um, transition uh, translation from Hebrew on some of the uh, nouns that, that are used that are male. When in fact, you know, in, in the King, New King James Bible, a male, they say he, he, he. And then in the Hebrew, it's actually uh, some of them can be feminine. I mean, so could the Antichrist actually be a feminist? Feminine. Could it be, you know... Well, getting in there. Lori, let's, let's try to pull everything together here. You brought up the election. It's mm-hmm. interesting that we find ourselves right now looking at three candidates basically that are left, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and uh, also Ted Cruz. Now mm-hmm. we know that Ted Cruz cannot get the nomination without it going to a disputed convention. Right. Donald Trump still has a chance of getting enough votes, and some people are projecting that he will get enough votes and he will become the nominee on the Republican side. It seems certain that Hillary's going to be the Democratic nominee. But yeah. if we see either Trump or Cruz, it's interesting that both of them claim to be anti establishment. Lori, listen to me carefully. The biggest issue of this campaign is. Will we elect an establishment candidate or a non-establishment candidate? The establishment has been controlling both parties for at least the last 50 or 60 years. So Mm -hmm. no matter who we voted for, we were voting for Tweedledee or Tweedledum. Now the Mm -hmm. big question between Trump and Cruz is, is Cruz really an anti-established candidate? He's tried to paint himself like that. However, now then, uh, Jeb Bush is endorsing him. Most of the major establishment people in the Republican Party are now endorsing him, but they're fighting tooth and nail to try to stop Donald Trump from getting the nomination because the establishment is trying to push us into the new world order, the one world governmental system. That's the biggest issue in this campaign. They do not want a wall built. They want open borders so that we can have global governance. That's the big design, the move, moving us toward a one world government. Donald Trump is threatening what they've been working for for the last 50 or 60 years by saying we are going to build a wall because if you don't have defensible borders, you don't have a country. And of course he's right. right. If we have no borders, if we don't defend our borders, then we don't have a country. We have a global village, which is what the establishment, both Republican and Democrat, have been working for toward the last 50, 60, 80 years. So that's really the biggest issue of the campaign we presently find ourselves in. And of course, Hillary Clinton is very much a one worlder herself. She believes in global governance as well. So that's the biggest thing that you're really contending with in this present election. Hey, Lori, I got to let you go. Thank you very much for your input today. I want to go now. Uh, let's go to Julie calling from right here in Texas. Hello, Julie. Hi, hi, uh, Pastor Baxter. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. You? Good, good, good. I love what you just said about Republicans and Democrats being one. They are one. They work together really quite well and uh, working against us. Um, I um, also love what you said about we need to be courageous because God is at work. And, and, you know, sometimes we cower, but we have got to start being courageous because it's amazing that we are looking. I mean, it's amazing that we're looking at these end times. And even the lost know that that contract and that peace treaty is coming. 
they know there's going to be a two-state solution. And um, it's uh, fantastic to even think that we've arrived there, and we are arriving there. Tomorrow's a huge day, so I'll be watching that. Um, so I heard you say that um, Jerusalem won't be given up by the Jews. And I've heard you say that before, and I not I mean, I'm not sure. So, But what, I have this verse in Chapter 11 where it says, uh, Revelation, sorry, where uh, he says, do not uh, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship in it. But the court which is without the temple, leave it out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And so that's the holy temple site. But then it says, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 42 months. And I don't understand, you know, why, why I agree they're going to they're gonna give over the temple mount, but somehow they must give over the holy city. So I didn't know how you thought about that. So I'm, that's my question. Yeah, okay, Julie. Uh, and it's a good question, by the way. The uh, passage there in Revelation 11, verse 1 and 2, John was told to measure the temple and those that worship therein, but don't measure the outer court because it will be trodden down the Gentiles. It appears that this scripture is dealing specifically with the temple mount, which of course biblically is Mount Moriah. It is not dealing with the entire um, entity of the city of Jerusalem. Now the reason I know that is because there's another passage in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2. It says, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished and half of the city will go forth into captivity. Now this is specifically speaking about the battle of Armageddon. And it says during the battle of Armageddon that half of Jerusalem will fall to the Antichrist and his one world government armies. So that means that all of the city has been retained by Israel up until the Battle of Armageddon when it will fall in fact to the armies of the Antichrist. That's the reason I am so sure that okay. Israel will retain Jerusalem all during the final seven years. Okay, so, so when they say and the holy city, that just means, you know, the part with the Temple Mount. Yes, that makes that, sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, well thank you very much, Julie. I appreciate the phone call. Wow, what days we are living in. You can't listen to a news report that doesn't fulfill Bible prophecy in one way or another. I've got another one for you. I mean, I've got a list of 20 articles in front of me right now that I'm not even going to get to over two or three of them on this program. But I'm talking about articles that are just absolutely amazing. Um, this article came out just two days ago. It came out in the Jerusalem Post. Hopes for Temple Mount to be flattened expressed by Passover sacrifice ceremony. At a model Passover sacrifice ceremony on the Mount of Olives, attended by approximately 400 people, several public figures expressed the hope that the Dome of the Rock Shrine and the Al-Aqsa Mosque will soon be removed from the Temple Mount. Now let me pause to tell you that's not going to happen because Revelation 11 verse 1 and 2 paints a picture of the Temple Mount being under a sharing arrangement with both Muslims and Jews worshiping there. Nevertheless, this is what they see because they don't have the advantage of that prophecy. They wouldn't read it if they had it because they don't believe in the New Testament. However, I want to go on and make sure you are able to see this. Hard right Jerusalem City Council member Arya King said he hoped that the Temple Mount would soon be free of what he termed the abomination currently at the site, while Rabbi Israel Ariel, head of the Temple Institute, by the way, I go to the Temple Institute every year, and former Knesset candidate for the band Ka party said the event was preparation for when the Temple Mount would be flattened and cleaned and the temple rebuilt. The model ceremony included the various ancient temple rites prescribed by the Torah and Jewish law, including slaughtering a lamb by the Kahonim priest in the white robes used in temple times, the sprinkling of the blood and the burning of fats and other parts of the lamb on a model altar, and the blowing of trumpets by the Kohanim. Now, this was all done Monday. 
they actually offered a Passover sacrifice. However, it was not the official sacrifice because the Passover sacrifice has to be offered on the Temple Mount and the Supreme Court of Israel would not allow them to do that because it would have ignited World War III. So consequently, instead they went up to the Mount of Olives and you can look down on the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. The article goes on to say, the Passover sacrifice is one of the religious commandments of the Torah the Torah being the Jewish, the five books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The commandments of the Torah obliging Jews to sacrifice a lamb on the Temple Mount on the day before the Passover pilgrimage holiday and eat on the first night of the festival. Now the Bible does mandate that. That's the reason. When Jesus was near Jerusalem, he said to his disciples who were with him, he was three days away from Jerusalem. He said, I must walk today and tomorrow because it cannot be that a prophet perish outside of Jerusalem. Jesus was hurrying there because he knew it was time for him to die. And he also knew that he was going to be the Passover lamb that year. That's the reason when Jesus appeared on the shores of the Jordan River, when John the Baptist was baptizing, John the Baptist, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was then crucified on Preparation Day, which is the day before Passover. That would be today because Passover starts tomorrow. Jesus was crucified. What's that mean? That means we don't need a Passover lamb anymore. He was the Lamb of God that permanently took away the sin of the world. The Jewish people by and large do not yet embrace that. They do not yet believe that. Consequently, they find themselves trying to go back under the old covenant, which has now been replaced by the new covenant. That does not mean the old covenant was not valid in the time when it was in force. It was valid. It was given by God. But it was a type and shadow of the realities that would come when the new covenant was established. In the Old Testament, it said, a new covenant will I make with you. Well, that new covenant was made with the Jewish people by Jesus Christ. They have temporarily rejected that covenant, but it won't be very long until they're going to get their eyes open to it. They're going to believe it and they're going to accept the new covenant. It's going to be a great time. Well, we've got one segment to go. We will be taking your calls during the last segment of our program today. But I want to say to all of you out there, join with us. The greatest revival the world has ever known is just ahead. Join hands with us. Let, to, where there's unity, there's strength. If you'd like to be a member of the End Time team by becoming a partner, the number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. Just tell our operators, I want to be a partner with End Time Ministries. I believe in what you're doing. I believe it's the End Time. 1-800-END TIME. I was listening to Politics and Religion and I heard an announcement about End Time Ministries hosting a Bible study on understanding the end time at their headquarters. My husband and I were studying Bible prophecy and had been listening to Irvin Baxter for several years. We began attending the lessons and immediately our eyes were opened to so much more of the Bible and the prophecies of end time events. As the Word of God filled our hearts, the Lord began to restore our broken marriage. We continued to grow spiritually with End Time University. Through revelation and obedience to the Word, we were born again and our lives were forever transformed. This teaching inspired us to share with family and friends, and we began hosting our own End Time Bible study out of the comfort of our own home. We popped in the DVD, served snacks, had wonderful fellowship, and built lasting friendships. There is no greater joy than living for God, sharing the gospel, and helping others understand the prophecies of the Bible. You can do the same in your community too. Go to endtime.com and under events, click the Bible Studies link or call 1-800-END-TIME to start your own End Time Bible Study today. We do have open lines. The number to call if you'd like to be on the air with me, 877-END-TIME to contact our operators and become a partner with End Time Ministries. That number is 800-END-TIME. 
So if you can remember 877 in time, that's me. 800 in time, that's our operators that you can reach there. If you have not yet been through the Understanding in Time series, it's more important than your next vacation. It's more important than your next car. It's more important than almost anything. You need to get through this course right now. When you get done, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you will understand the prophecy of the Bible. And if you don't, we'll give you a full refund of, the, of your donation amount, whatever that may be. So uh, I urge you to get, understand the Bible. You will understand the nations that will be on this earth at the time of the second coming. They are specifically mentioned in the Bible. You'll also know which nations will participate in the kingdom of the Antichrist. You will know where the Antichrist will come from. You will know who the false prophet is and many other things that are so absolutely vital to you. You'll know what the seven trumpets of Revelation stand for. You'll understand them. Five of them have already happened and it's worth, well, it's worth everything to you. So don't forget the Understanding the End Time video series 14 one-hour DVDs, you go through this course and you will know more about Bible prophecy than 95% of the graduates from theological seminary. Your eyes will be open. You're going to know what's going on politically in world events. You're going to understand. And there's never been a more important time because we are entering right now the end time minefield. We are entering the time of more prophetic fulfillment than any other period of time in the history of the world. We're moving into it right now. You're going to see it. You're going to live through it. But if you don't understand the prophecies, you'll see things, but you won't know what you're seeing. You won't understand it. And you don't need to be doing that. That's like walking through a minefield blindfolded. Not a good idea. So anyway, understand the end times, the series, the number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. To be on the air with me, 877-END-TIME. Now, I was talking about this sacrifice that was just offered earlier this week by the Temple Institute. Now, by the way, the Temple Institute has now recreated all the furniture and all the utensils needed for the resumption of temple administration. Now, I'm talking about all of them. I was just there a few weeks ago. I saw them with my own eyes. These are not replicas. These are the very items that will be put to use very shortly, just as soon as they get this peace deal and the temple is reconstructed, they will use all of these elements, these vessels, these utensils, and they will resume temple worship just like was done in the Old Testament. Now, what does this mean to you and me? Should they do this? No, they shouldn't because Jesus Christ has fulfilled all those things. However, they don't know it yet. While they're doing this, we're hoping to be able to preach to them, to teach them how that Jesus Christ fulfilled every one of these, these things. Now, I've been asked many times, so we get this peace agreement that launches the final seven years. How long will it take them to build the Jewish temple? I put that question to Rabbi Heim Richman, who is uh, the executive, the international executive director of the Temple Institute. He said, with modern technology, we believe we can do it in one year. So the Bible specifically teaches us that the temple will be completed within the first three and one half years. Once they get the peace deal, they're probably going to start on the construction pretty quickly. It's my understanding that they right now are working on the architectural drawings for the new temple. They're serious. And these same people were offering this Passover sacrifice just this past Monday. Let me read the rest of the article for you. The sacrifice was conducted just next to Beit Orat Yeshiva on the Mount of Olives in full view of the Temple Mount. I stand on the Mount of Olives every single year. The Passover sacrifice is one of the religious commandments of the Torah, obliging Jews to sacrifice a lamb on the Temple Mount on the day before the Passover pilgrimage holiday and eat on the first night of the festival, which will be tomorrow night. The organizers, the joint staff of the temple organizations, emphasize that the event on Monday was a simulation and not supposed to represent the actual sacrifice. Speaking before the cer ceremony began, King 
who heads the United Jerusalem faction in the Jerusalem Municipal Council decried the current situation in which Jews are still prevented by the government from going to the Temple Mount and performing the Passover sacrifice. We're here opposite the Temple Mount, he continued. We can see the abomination upon it, and we need to wish that even in our days we won't see it anymore, and we'll see there the altar, the Kohanim, and the Levaim, and we'll see ourselves there. Also addressing the crowd was Rabbi Israel Ariel, who expounded on passages from the Talmud relating to the Temple Mount. Now, Rabbi Ariel is the man who founded the Temple Institute many years ago. He was present when Israel reclaimed the Temple Mount in the 1967 war. He felt called of God to restruct all the vessels and the utensils. He and his organization have been working untiringly ever since that time. Now they finished their mission. The last edition I viewed for the first time in November of 2013, after we went through the entire Temple Institute, the brazen altar where the sacrifices are offered, the laver where the priests are to wash, the golden candlesticks that provide light into the holy place, the table of shewbread, the altar of incense. They're all there. And we were walking through, we were seeing all these items. However, this year was different. I've been doing this ever since 1993, but this year was different because our guide to the Temple Institute then stepped back to a set of draperies, pulling the drawstrings. I found myself staring full face at the Ark of the Covenant. That's right. The Temple Institute has now been built an Ark of the Covenant which they intend to use until they find the old Ark of the Covenant, which was last seen in 586 B.C. That's the last record we have. It was in the first temple, which was destroyed in 586 by the Babylonians under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, I was just reading recently that Jeremiah preached that the destruction of the temple was at hand, and he was actually in the court of the prison in Jerusalem when the temple was being destroyed. Now, many people have rumored that since Jeremiah knew it was coming, that he may have removed the Ark of the Covenant to a safe place. I understand that in the Jewish Apocrypha, it says that the Ark of the Covenant was taken and hidden in a cave. I don't know whether that is accurate or whether it is not. All I know is, we don't need an Ark of the Covenant anymore anyway. Those were types and shadows of New Testament realities. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, there were the, ten, the, the two stones containing the Ten Commandments. There was a pot of the manna and there was Aaron rod that budded. All these things were types and shadows of the New Testament realities that we enjoy today. The Bible says concerning today and the New Covenant that the true worshipers will no longer worship in Jerusalem or on the mountain of Samaria, but the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The manna was a type of the spirit. The Ten Commandments were a type of the truth. The true worshipers must worship the Father in spirit and in truth. If you don't understand the New Testament plan of salvation, by the way, when we say New Testament, Old Testament, let me briefly comment on that. The word testament means will, the old, the new will and testament of Sadie Hawkins or whatever. So when we say the New Testament, we mean the Old Testament, we mean the old will of God. When we say the New Testament, we mean the new will of God. The Old Testament was a stopgap measure given to us until the New Testament could come. The Bible tells us the Old Testament, those were simply types and shadows. The Bible says the Old Testament was a schoolmaster bringing us to Christ. We had the law, but nobody could keep the law. The Bible says no flesh was justified by the law. So when Jesus came, he came to say, you don't need to obtain righteousness by trying to keep these commandments any longer. Now then, I am your righteousness. 
So now when you're born again, I will come in and live inside of you and I will write my laws upon the tables of your hearts. And now then you who follow me will be able to keep the commandments, not because you try, but because you become like me. And since I gave those commandments, they're an expression of my nature, you'll be able to keep the commandments. So the law could not save us. It merely gave us the knowledge of sin. The Bible says by the law came the knowledge of sin. I would not known what sin was, except the law said thou shalt not covet. So the law was given to us so we would know what sin is, but the Holy Ghost was given to us so we could overcome sin and walk in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Even as he was man inhabited by the Spirit of God, he gave us the Holy Spirit so we too can be human beings inhabited by the Spirit of God. Now that's the reason Jesus said you must be born again or you cannot enter the kingdom of God. I've written a brochure called, What Do You Mean Born Again? It's important because that's what Jesus said we must do to be saved. It's not that mystical. It's very easy to understand. The brochure is yours free of charge. Simply pick up the phone and call us 1-800-END-TIME and say, please send to me the What Do You Mean Born Again track. Or if you'd like to have it immediately, go to our website, endtime.com. That's E-N-D-T-I-M-E dot com. And about halfway down on the page, you will see What Do You Mean Born Again? You can read it for yourself. If you read it and still don't understand it, then call us here at 1-800-END-TIME, ask to speak to one of our ministers, and they will help you through this entire uh, process so you can know exactly what Jesus Christ meant when he said, except a person is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, for those of you that have already been through our Understand the End Time series, and maybe you're hungry for more, you do realize we have another course called Understanding the Bible. We go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We start out with, why did God create the human race? Have you ever wondered why you were here? Many people live and die and never know why they were here. Once you understand why God created the human race, we all can understand how we fit into God's plan. And then he created Adam and Eve as sons of God, but they lost their status through their disobedience. There's not another son of God in the Old Testament until Jesus Christ came, the second Adam. He was the second son of God. And then he made a plan whereby all of us can become sons of God called being born again. So all I'm letting you know is God is at work in the earth and we would love to send you, what do you mean born again? Also, if you'd like to be a partner with us, we need you, whether it's unity or strength. The number to call to be a partner with End Time Ministries, 1-800-END-TIME, 1-800-363-8463. God bless you all. We'll be right back here this time tomorrow. End of the Age is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.